Hello everybody. Look, there's a kitty here. How's it going, Romeo? Welcome to the Democrat series. Today we're going to go to, I think we're up to number five or six in this series. Uh, you guys seem to really like it, so we'll just keep moseying on down the line. Although I should say, according to Real Clear Politics, uh, now this guy is actually ahead of Kamala Harris. So um, as things change, I will um, adjust my series accordingly in time. Now the candidate we're going to talk about this week is the one that has the really hard to pronounce name that everyone talks about. His name is uh Pai 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 Tor Buttigieg. We're going to talk about this guy. So Mayor Pete as he is regularly called, uh Pete Buttigieg is from uh the city of South Bend, Indiana. She's from Indiana. Buttigieg's father is an immigrant from Malta who was on track to become a Catholic priest, a Jesuit priest specifically, but eventually just became a kind of Catholic university professor. In 2000, Buttigieg graduated from high school as valedictorian, which makes him, I think, one of the first, if not one of the only uh, millennial candidates for president who is currently running. So there's some generational representation going on here. One thing I do want to include, even though it's probably pointless, but I really, really wanted to make sure that you walk away knowing that this happened. One of the things that Buttigieg did is that uh, when he was a high school student, he won an essay writing contest and he got to go to Washington DC and everything about it. And the subject of his essay was about how great and brave and how much integrity Bernie Sanders as a politician has. Um, just wanted to mention that one. Oh yeah, and he went to Harvard. Buttigieg has gone through a lot of different jobs and careers over his life. He's switched streams quite a lot, which, you know, as a fellow millennial, I definitely feel. Uh, his first job was actually as an investigative intern for a news organization, so um, that's his start. He then moved on to being a conference planner for a think tank. Then in 2004, he was a volunteer on the John Kerry campaign where he was a policy person, and then after that he became a consultant. In 2007 he was a campaign staffer for Barack Obama, and one of the things that he noticed while he was on the campaign trail is that there was this strong disparity between the families that had lots of their young people sent off to go to war on the other side of the world, and how uh, a lot of families don't experience it at all, so it's kind of like concentrated in a few uh, communities and, and families, and because of that, after the election he was incensed to actually enlist himself and became uh, part of the Navy. And in 2009 he did. He joined the Navy, he became a intelligence officer, an ensign. The main job that he had when he was in the Navy was about intercepting and trying to infiltrate and break apart uh, terrorist finance networks. If you remember in a video I did a long, long time ago about the history of Al-Qaeda, you'll know that Al-Qaeda funded itself using some underhanded financial techniques that specifically abused things like um, like nonprofits and uh, like foreign aid and things like that in order to get money into Al-Qaeda through wealthy sympathizers in places like Saudi Arabia. And so Buttigieg's job was part of that. Part of trying to disrupt that. Sorry, that could have come off very wrong. Another thing he did when he was in the military was as a armed uh, driver, somebody who would go on dangerous trips. He actually called himself once a military Uber. Uh, he would be basically in charge of driving vehicles with important people on them and making sure that while they were on the roads, they were avoiding things like IEDs and mines and things like that so that they wouldn't get in trouble. And over his period serving in Afghanistan, he actually learned Dari, which is a form of Persian that is spoken in Afghanistan. He then left the service in 2017. Now, despite him leaving the military in 2017, he got elected mayor of South Bend, Indiana, in 2011. When he got to office, he was 29 years old, which made him the second youngest mayor of South Bend, Indiana. So now we're getting into his political career. We can actually talk about policy and stuff like that, right? We can talk about all the the, the hands-on mayoral experience that Buttigieg is going to bring to the White House. And um, he demoted the police chief for recording his phone calls, which was a crime, but apparently previous police chiefs had also been doing that and the police chief himself sued the government because he made the argument that Buttigieg only did it because uh, he was black. It was determined that his recording of these phone calls did violate the Wiretap Act, 
And this uh, court case is actually still in federal courts right now, so uh, there's no solution to this, but it's just a thing that is ongoing at the moment. As a response, Buttigieg also called for the removal of racial bias in the police system, which, um, interesting attempt. Another project he did was this uh, urban restoration project, which was nicknamed like a thousand homes in a thousand days, which the idea was to take a bunch of houses that had been uh, falling into disrepair in South Bend and try and, I say houses, buildings, try and get them either repaired or demolished. And apparently he did this. He was successful. The other thing that I want to bring up, and I'm not exactly sure how it works exactly, but Mayor Buttigieg then took seven months off from being mayor to serve in the Naval Reserves in Afghanistan, which um, I have a couple questions about because I'm just like, can, can, you, can you just leave your job as mayor to go to Afghanistan for seven months? Like, I guess that's just a thing you can do. Uh, I did not know that. The second thing is, what does the Navy do in a landlocked country? If you have answers to these questions, please let me know down in the description. I'm actually very curious. Be that as it may, Buttigieg got a second term as mayor of South Bend. He then got onto the public stage in 2015 when Mike Pence passed the religious freedom-y bill. You might remember it as the gay wedding cake bill. You might remember this. Uh, Buttigieg as a openly gay mayor of South Bend uh, stood up against this because at the time, as I said, Mike Pence was governor of Indiana. So uh, I remember when this all went down and uh, yeah, this is kind of when he got himself national notoriety. He actually came out as gay during this scandal in order to express his solidarity with all of the LGBTQIA plus people of South Bend and Indiana in general. He then did a urban revival project that involved uh, increasing street safety. Apparently this involved a lot of turning one-way streets into two-way streets and creating roundabouts and all the kinds of things you hear about on Vox that are like things that would improve cities with all the wonky stuff. But very, very, very important is his project with something called the Night Lights Project, which uh, was funded through private donors for $700,000, and it is a laser light show that takes place there. If President Buttigieg does not live up to his legacy of mayor and put together a laser light show, a federal laser light show, I will be disappointed. He also launched a $50 million program to invest in city parks, you know, like mayory stuff. But then, then, Buttigieg did something a little different. In December of 2018, he announced that he is not going to be seeking another term as mayor, which surprised people because he was a successful mayor. What could he possibly be doing? Maybe he listened to a 2016 New York Times column in which uh, the author suggested he might become the first gay president. I don't know if you listened to that article specifically, but we all know how this story ends, which is in April of 2019. Pete Buttigieg just announced that he's going to run for president of all of the United States. He's going to turn the whole country into South Bend. So yeah, on April 14th, 2019, he announced he's going to run for president, uh, the first openly gay person to ever do so. Although Buttigieg will say in many interviews that he uh, does not think that he would be the first gay president. Which, as a historian, I, I tend to agree. Depends. It's complicated. So, like, literally, that's it. That's his, like, entire political career, an actual career up to a thing. Like, normally it would be much later in the video at this point, but that's, that he, the thing that sticks out about Buttigieg that we need to talk about is that he comes with a very, very short resume. Even for regular presidential candidates, usually the late 40s is like the golden period when people start running for president because they have a bit of a resume, but not a full resume. He's also very unusual because it's very rare that somebody goes from municipal politics to presidential politics. The most common route are senators or governors. And this is actually um, not unheard of, but definitely uncommon. So let's talk about Buttigieg on the issues. Uh, of course, uh, I forgot this for one episode, but we always start with the single most important issue of the 2020 campaign, which is climate change. Buttigieg is a proponent for the Green New Deal, which I think is now becoming the new Medicare for All, in which a word that 
candidates say when they know it's popular and they definitely don't have to put any legislation behind it. They can just say, yes, I support Medicare for all. I support a Green New Deal. The details of which are going to be murky and what they actually mean by it, they will definitely walk back. Uh, just watch the people on the Pod Save America podcast. They're going to figure out exactly how they're going to walk back from things like this. Either way, his platform seems to be a couple things, which is renewing the U.S.'s commitment to the Paris Climate Agreement and uh, investing in solar energy. That's about all I could get. He's not a very policy heavy guy either. This is gonna be a very short video. Uh, Pete Buttigieg is pro-choice, which I think is almost required now to be a Democratic presidential candidate, uh, unless you're Joe Biden, apparently. Okay, that's not fair to Joe Biden. It's a little fair to Joe Biden. Don't vote for Joe Biden. To kind of give him some bona fides on this, which is kind of strange because he's a mayor, uh, there was one case in South Bend where he intentionally blocked a zoning request to put a pro-life group right next to a abortion clinic, and he made sure that didn't happen. So I guess, you know, he's he's got he's got credit on that. I'm gonna have to really stretch for this, okay? <laughs> on the criminal justice angle, he is for eliminating the death penalty. Woot. He's for getting rid of all of the prohibitions on marijuana, legalizing marijuana. Woot woot. He does want to restore voting rights for felons, but not people in prison. This was part of uh, when there was a, you know, controversy a while back when Bernie Sanders said that he wanted prisoners to have the right to vote. Buttigieg is one of the people who came out and said that he's against that idea. Uh, but he does want to get rid of the criminal records of people who had minor drug offenses in the past and get a lot of them out of prison. He also said that he was troubled by the commutation of Chelsea Manning when she was let out of prison and uh, has explicitly said that he disagrees with uh, things like, um, like leaks and things like that and that there should be more congressional oversights so that these leaks don't have to happen. Fat chance, buddy. One thing that Buttigieg does, and one other candidate that I'm sure you're gonna hear about a lot in the comments, points to is that automation is the main cause of the loss of manufacturing jobs and not uh, scapegoating immigrants, which I think is an important thing to discuss, and I'm glad that he's bringing this to the table. I hope this becomes more of a discussion topic in the future of the Democratic primaries. He wants to work with labor unions, but he does consider himself, quote unquote, a democratic capitalist, which, um, is not a thing. Democratic capitalist is like the jumbo shrimp of politics. They're literally opposites. But he does want to work with labor unions. So it does sound like he's going from the typical Democratic playbook of being able to both have cake and eat it at the same time. Uh, a good electoral strategy, but not really a great one for developing policy. He's also said that he's receptive to antitrust legislation against tech companies, a la what Elizabeth Warren's proposed. A lot of his policies seem to come more from him responding to other people having policies than like, you know, his own actual platform. Somebody on Twitter was saying to me, and I don't know how true this is, so take this with a huge grain of salt, that he's on the record saying that Democrats shouldn't focus so much on policy and have more vague ideas. And you know, you know how I feel about vague ideas in this series so far. Uh, he has other electoral things that he wants to do besides making sure that people in prison can't vote, but that felons who used to be in prison can. Uh, he also wants to get rid of the Electoral College, which I think is a basic thing that most people should acknowledge, but unfortunately this is still a political fight that the Americans have to have. All right, with his like electoral stuff out of the way, let's move to foreign policy. Iraq war bad, Afghanistan good, pro troops in Syria, also loves Israel. You know, I could do without this foreign policy, to be honest. To soften his position on Israel, just being straight up pro-Israel, he does say that he is quote unquote disappointed with the zeal in which Netanyahu is expanding illegal settlements into Palestinian territories. So what what a what a what a saintly figure. He's also gone on the record of being pro-imposing sanctions on Venezuela pending they have another election so that Juan Guaido can become president, more or less. Because there was an election and Juan Guaido literally boycotted it, and so he didn't win. But that's not democratic because... reasons. See, it's okay to impose sanctions until they have an election in which your guy wins. Uh, 
if anything, that is very much in line with American presidential politics and history. So he has also advocated for a single payer healthcare system, which uh, that's good. What does that mean? Uh, oh, um, he is very much for an incrementalist approach to it. So it's like a, a goal to move towards, but wants to have it on a much like longer time scale than say a Bernie Sanders who would have it happen very soon into his presidency. His first acts on healthcare are more to do like rate setting and things like that, which like, I guess, but really there's no way to like mince past that you're gonna have to destroy the healthcare insurance industry in order to have a healthcare system that doesn't actively prey on people. Kind of light on immigration stuff, he's a pro-DACA, as, uh, as many Democrats are. I don't think we've found an anti-DACA presidential candidate for the Democrats yet. He also has possibly the most centrist position I've ever seen on the Supreme Court, in which he wants to have a 15-member Supreme Court, and five of which can only be put on the bench if the other 10 members agree to it. So uh, this is his idea of like, okay, we'll have five conservatives and five liberals and then five chosen from all of them. This is a formula for a functioning court that would definitely work. Now, the last thing I've got here is the stuff he has on social issues. So number one, he wants to make sure that LGBTQIA plus people get uh, included as a protected class under the Federal Equality Act, a thing that is still not the case you can still be legally fired just for being gay in America. He is against Donald Trump's ban of trans members serving in the military. He opposes free college tuition, and his rationale for this is something that is truly a galaxy brain meme type of take. He wants college to keep having tuition because if you got rid of college tuition, then that disproportionately helps the children of rich kids paid for on the backs of all of the poor people who don't go to university. For, for a millennial who's running for president, this is truly baffling because uh, university and post-secondary education are not exactly elective things anymore. If anything, the people who don't go to college or university or trade school or anything like that are really, really screwed. And having free tuition would definitely get a lot of those people who don't go to college going to college so that they can compete, hopefully, and have opportunities that they wouldn't have had before. It, it's just, it's so, oh. He also supports Washington DC statehood as well as Puerto Rican statehood if they want it, which are not bad ideas. That is a easy way to bring in two solidly democratic states into the union, which in the current moment in which like white rural people living in Wyoming have like 600 times the political power of someone living in California, uh, I see as good as a way to at least attempt to balance out the power imbalance going on in American politics brought on by the, 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 the makers of the country who also owned people. And not like in that they like owned their asses at Overwatch, like literally owned them. And is one like truly unique project that makes Buttigieg stand out as a candidate because I don't think anyone else has said anything like this. And honestly, it's like, really it's just it's the buddha judge thing is that he wants to have mandated federal service for all americans when they turn 18 which would mean that they spend a year doing something he did specify not necessarily the military but something kind of what they have in europe like in germany where you can spend a year either in mandatory military service or doing some sort of federal service which like you know we can debate over whether or not that's a good idea, but like when you have the world literally on fire because we have a broken economic model that is fundamentally incompatible with reality and we refuse to face that, is like this really the crown jewel? your policy platform. All right, let's talk about a few considerations about Pete Buttigieg. Um, obviously from this, I could not really conceal that I'm very disappointed in him as a candidate. He's got some good positions. He's got a lot of the safe democratic positions that you can really expect from any other candidate really. 
Uh, the stuff that he has that makes him stick out from the field are typically him pushing in a more rightward direction. And his federal service thing is just, it's like, it's such a weird small thing that's not really, uh, in my mind, worth becoming an election issue. Like, honestly, at this point, the election should come down to like, maybe three major issues. Climate change, uh, economic inequality, and healthcare. Maybe electoral reform. Like those are like the three or four things you really, really need to talk about in this election. And his position on all of them are like his, his climate change one is non-committal. His healthcare one is non-committal and his electoral reform one is at least decent. And his position on economic inequality is awful. He basically has no problem with it. This guy's got like 9% of the popular vote right now. I don't, I don't understand why. There's just, I don't, he just seems so formless. Um, if you have a reason why you really like Pete Buttigieg, I would love to hear about it. Cause like right now he's just like a person that you have, like it's impossible to tell what he really wants. And when you're choosing who you want to support for president, now you can, I, now I'm not your boss, you can, decide who you want to back any way you want. But in my mind, you should choose the people that you want to back politically based on their professional record, the things that they have advocated and pushed for with their lifetime of career work and the kind of platform that they put forward when they run for office. This is not an election for country mascot. This is a job. This is changing policy and law in a way that you agree with. And you should really not have a loyalty to anyone's personality or uh, really anything to do with the person behind them. This is a job that you are deciding which direction you want your organization you belong to to move in. And you should really be ready to drop them the first sign that they're not going to do the things that you want them to do. We need to be more like the British. The British like openly hate every politician who works for them. We should be a little bit more like the British. I don't know. This is the, this is the big, this is the big stickler that I have with American politics, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to get very mad at me for the things I just said. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to hearing what your thoughts are in the comments. So this week, as they come out, the debates are going to happen, and in my mind, a lot of the numbers are going to start changing because now the candidates can no longer just have host their own events. They actually have to talk to each other and compare and contrast their policies, which means that uh, when you know you get a closer idea of what the actual choice is, I think you're going to find people moving towards the people that they like more and not just kind of rely on name recognition. Anyways, next week is Beto O'Rourke. Maybe. If the numbers change a lot, it might be someone else. But uh, at the moment, that's what it's looking like. And also, if you want to keep the series going and you want to help me out, patreon.com slash stepbackhistory. At the end of this week, I'm going to be a full-time YouTuber. And um, if I am to pay rent and eat food and stuff, uh, I, I, I'm going to be relying on all y'all to help me out, so please. And if you can't contribute financially, I totally get it. Uh, please share my video with anyone you want. Um, it would really help because word of mouth is really the only way to step back grows because the algorithm, not a big fan of me. If anyone knows George Soros, you know, uh, uh, let them know, let them know I'm here. Peace out, everybody. This is apparently very important to her, so I'm gonna have to include it.